it started out on a night I took off, November 6th of 2000. I was, I was sitting in London with my family um, watching uh, My Democracy here in the States. And I'm seeing people get in front of the BBC television cameras. And they're saying, you know, I tried to vote. But, uh, you know, I, by the way, sound of, oh, that's not me, that's a car out there. <laughs> God. I'm trying, I, great. I didn't want the FBI agents in the audience to be making noise. I mean, just record. <laughs> Take careful notes. Um, anyway, the, uh, so I'm watching all, you know, this, the television screen, I'm seeing like one black face, uh, one, you know, first is a black face comes up. I try to vote in Florida, and they uh, try to vote. They said I was a criminal. I knocked off a 7-Eleven in Utah in 1964. I'm a criminal. I can't vote, even though it wasn't me. Someone else gets up, and they say, I try to vote, but I couldn't find my name on the voter registry. And they said, uh, you're out of luck, et cetera. And one face after another after another, and they're all black. And then the story just disappeared from the TV screens. After a couple days, and we got onto chads and butterflies. Now, um, if, for those of you who uh, watched uh, a program called Politically Incorrect a few weeks ago, uh, when I was on, I was called a conspiracy nut, which always gets a big laugh from the conspirators. And, <laughs> and so, uh, November, si November 6, 7, 8, in my conspiracy nut mind, notes. Um, in my conspiracy nut mind, I'm, I'm thinking maybe there's some kind of computer program which is like, you know, zooming in on black names on the voter rolls and removing them. Uh, and here is the, uh, the program. <laughs> this is, or as uh, part of, uh, oops. Just disappeared on me. Um, ah, it's okay. Bill. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah um, which that's a. For, oh God, we're in Seattle, so I got to be a little more specific because I say computer programs a database which is put into an Excel spreadsheet. I usually say Lotus, but here I got to say Excel. And um, yeah. I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm in the town that, that invented the phrase, you have performed an illegal activity. <laughs> oh, no, I haven't, Bill. In fact, what I, what I don't understand is why they don't, you know, what you would expect on the computer screen is a little note to come up that says, Mr. Gates is terribly sorry for one more goddamn flaw in his program. <laughs> illegal. So, uh, I want to talk about an illegal... Uh, perform an illegal operation with a computer, if not a pornographic operation with a computer. So on this computer screen, which is disappearing from me, but uh, here we go. Um, very interesting. Um, yeah, I got this out of the files of the Florida Secretary of State, Catherine Harris, her Department of Elections. There was a list of um, 50, 57,000 700 people who are listed, who are marked for removal. Harris in May before the elections and then lettered and then uh, sent out this list saying remove to each Florida election supervisor, remove these names from the voter lists because they are felons and you can't vote in Florida if you've committed a felony crime in Florida. Okay, it's, it's only in the Deep South you have these laws, but that's the law that if, if people, if illegal people are registered, they should be thrown off the list. Okay? Fine. One problem with the list, and I was, I was looking at this one, and you come here and you see this whole, because I actually have the whole thing. I got CD-ROMs which are cracked by volunteers and put into nice little spreadsheets. And, and, um, and it said, it caught my eye, um, like, for example, right on this is Thomas Cooper, and he was convicted on January 30th, 2007. 
Okay. I'm looking through the list and I'm finding a lot of people convicted in the future, in the next millennium, which is really great. You know, Catherine Harris, detective of the future, looks through her the ball and zooms out and grabs those bad guys and brings it back and says, you can't vote in Florida, we know what you're going to do. But 90, how many, so I go through people convicted in the future, people convicted before they're born. <laughs> lots of interesting names, people, lots of, lot, uh, there's a whole criminal gang apparently called Jane Doe. And um, we went through with a, a team from Salon.com, volunteers, we went down into Florida, went through the list, statisticians, demographers, you name it. And the uh, county elections supervise themselves, and we determined that it looks like of the 57,700 names, uh, at least 90.2% of the people on the list are innocent. Innocent. Well, not quite innocent because 54% of them are not white. So not completely innocent because over half the people are black. Now, black, I mean, and how do I know that? Because if you go down through the list and you come up, take a look at this stuff or get it in the book or see Harper's, it has right next to the voter's name, black, black, white, white, black, 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 right next to the voter's name. It's like a South African police roster. No one's guessing when they took the names off, they weren't guessing. They knew. They knew the color of those votes too. Right? Eighty percent of all black people registered in Florida voted. Ten to one, they voted for Al Gore. Florida Secretary of State Harris named George Bush the winner of Florida and therefore the winner of the White House by 537 votes. 57,700 names marked for removal. You do the arithmetic. You tell me who was elected president, right? You read that in your papers. Actually, you did. I have to say, that be, in all fairness, I did. That was reported in the Washington Post with a with a byline with a, my analysis under my byline. I, you know, come on, let's be fair. I broke the story in Britain in November, two weeks after the election. Al Gore was still in the race, and the Post ran that story in June. They're on it. They're on case. And one of the things that the Washington Post people didn't let me write. And because their investigative team, they said that they looked into it. They looked into it. And what they couldn't find is that it was deliberate. They said, well, it's an error. You know, it's just, you know, it's just, a, just an error, which is a hell of a thing to call the President of the United States. <laughs> but a big error. Our democracy is a big error. And, okay. And um, so always very interesting because that's always look at what's happening with September 11th. It's like first you have the first stage now. Ron Ziegler used to, was the press secretary for Richard Nixon. You say uh, what we that that prior truth is now no longer is now inoperable. <laughs> so you know first they we didn't know anything. Oh, we knew something, but so the prior truth is inoperable. Here's the new truth. So Harris. Now here's the interesting thing. Harris did not deny. In, instead of, you, I was twisting maniacal, but she didn't say I was wrong. She did say, yeah, that's pretty big news, which is not covered. She didn't say I was wrong. She said thousands of people were targeted. Most of them were black, but she blamed everyone else. We'll get back to that. Deliberate. It wasn't deliberate, said the Washington Post. There, I was at Columbia School of Journalism with Seymour Hersh, another investigative reporter fired by the New York Times. Um, and, um, you know, get your two pill surprises out of here. We don't do investigative reporting anymore, but the Washington Post, they inside. Now, they didn't bother getting the list, and they didn't bother. So I said, did you go through the emails? Well, we didn't get a chance, because you can get the emails right off Catherine Harris's computer. That's what I did, and her office's computers. And remember Thomas Cooper? 2007, guy in the future? I found 500 people convicted in the future. Okay? And some 
And, and someone, a clerk in the office of uh, Catherine Harris's Division of Elections, it was actually her predecessor, Sandra Morthau, who was a, another Jeb Bush protege. They wrote, the clerk wrote a note, an email note saying, my God, we've got people convicted in the future. What do we do? Now, I went to LA city schools, but even I know what you do. If you take away people's civil rights by accident through a clerical error, give them back their civil rights. But the Florida function, the Florida politicos at the top of the office wrote back, we have it in writing, if you blank out the conviction dates, no one will know. Okay. Just an error. So who came up with this list? So I went a little bit farther. Who came up with this? Now, if you've read uh, Michael Moore's Stupid White Man, uh, you would know the answer to that is a company called DBT of Florida. It's owned by a company, Choice Point of Atlanta. Actually, that's another way I get in my, my stories into the press. And Michael Moore, in his polemics, picks up a lot of the reportage from uh, my work in, in Britain. And so that's how I sneak it around the, the the Berlin, the electronic Berlin wall that they've erected to keep my stuff out. You know, I say, well, I, I can't get it into ABC, so you know, give it to the fat guy in the chicken suit. <laughs> um, we'll get it in. We get the drips. In. Who came up with the list? DBT, but actually, that's the only part of the story. I'll give you a little bit more. Before database technologies, there was another company, Professional Services, which was paid five thousand dollars to come up with this list of potential of, of felons. Okay, and they were fired. They were fired by um, the Florida Department of Elections. And database technology, which has good Republican credentials, was hired to replace them. First, there was a bid. Database technology was the highest bidder. They said, hmm, let's go to a no bid contract. No bid database technology wins. Now, they fired the, for one company that was paid $5,000 a year to replace them with database technologies, which in the first year was paid $2.3 million. Oh, that interested me. There's 100,000 reporters down in Florida, which, and this ex interested exactly none of them. But I thought it was kind of interesting, and I thought, well, let me get a hold of this uh, contract. I mean, for two, well, two, 5,000, 2.3 million, for what? For 90.2% wrong? Well, I got a little suspicious of that because DBT, Division of Choice Point, these guys work for the FBI. They do manhunts. And the FBI doesn't pay millions to them to do their database searches uh, for 90.2% wrong. They've got 20 million. This company keeps 20 billion records on you. They know, sir, they know what you did on your third date in high school. And they know, and now they'll be hired to know which of you are patriots. Okay? But they know. They know whether Thomas Cooper of Ohio is the same Thomas Cooper of Tampa who will commit a crime in the future. Okay? They know. In fact, they were paid. One of the reasons that they were picked no bid is that they promised to do in their contract 273 million cross checks. Is it okay? But right next to the 273 million cross checks, there's a handwritten note in, in Catherine Harris's office that says, don't need. Ooh, or don't want, because when you have a list of 57,000 names and half of them are black, in other words, half of them are, may not, but Catherine Harris is called potential felons. No, there's no such thing as a potential felon in America. That's what makes us <laughs> great. But they were definitely potential gore voters. But maybe that, the two concepts kind of like, in her mind, you know, felon gore voter. We know what their crime was, right? Uh, so it wasn't that they didn't need the cross checks, but maybe they didn't want the cross checks. And they also got a bit of a, they also got a note from database technologies a little worried that they might be sued. And in fact, they have been now by the NAACP, which got my information. And the database technology said, don't blame us. Because we wrote a note, many notes. I mean, we have meetings, we have minutes of those meetings. So please don't sue us because we sent in notes that said, and we will read it to you, it says right here. We told them there are a, quote, a significant number of people who are not felons on the list. There's innocent people. We gave you a list of, with innocent people, and they said, here's how you cut it down. 
How far do you cut it down? A list of innocent people? Well, I went to Bob Butterworth, who's the Attorney General, and I said, Mr. Attorney General, if someone votes who's a felon, can't, has no right to vote in Florida, um, they have no right to vote, what would you do? He said, I'd bust him. I'd arrest him. I said, get to work, buddy. Start with Thomas Cooper before he commits the crime. Got 57,000 names to work on. I said, I know about the list. I said, you know about the list? Well, how many, how many of these people have you nailed? There's nearly 60,000 criminals out there, felons hankering for more jail time so they can vote for the school board. <laughs> how many felons out there? 57,000. He said, how many cases do you work on? I said, six. 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 Oh, I said, what happened to the crime wave? He says, yeah, there's a crime wave. The state was defrauded. We got a bogus list. I said, hey, who are you going to cuff? He said, no, no, Florida's unusual. We're one of the only states where the attorney general cannot act against fraud, on fraud against the state. The investigation, I said, well, who does it? Who, the investigation has to be done. He said, the investigation has to be done by Catherine Harris. <laughs> She's right on it. She's right on it. Um, by the way, the, um, that phrase about not significant, the uh, significant number of people who are not felons, those innocent people, innocent black people, innocent democratic people, was obtained through withering cross-examination of the company in special hearings, not by a regular session of a U.S. Congressional Committee, which wouldn't take it on, and not even by the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, which tried hard, but by brilliant cross-examination, 600 pages of transcript by but maybe the most brilliant member of Congress we have, most, who actually took all the documentation of mine and went through it and put that company on the spot, Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney in Atlanta. Yeah. They'll get that uppity black woman yet. Yeah. Um, well, I'm looking through the, uh, I'm looking through this contract. Wait. Let's see if I can find it. Because um, I realize I don't have the document here. This is a cheap way to pull the book out, huh? <laughs> but there's a, a, a page in the, because in, I have photocopies of different documents in this book. I'm a, like a document freak. You know, I'm always holding up documents. You know, I've got a document here. I just like Joe McCarthy to, you know, I, I've got a document here. <laughs> Except the difference between him and I is, I've got the document, right? <laughs> um, so so the, on page actually 29 of the book, for those who are reading along, <laughs> you know, hymn number 12, uh, it doesn't, it's not, it's not very well laid out, but it's, it actually is a photocopy from the contractor part of the page, which is deep, it says confidential and trade secret. Confidential and secret a part of the money and work to be done. In a government contract, I've had government contracts, secret? Confidential? Hmm, BBC said, again, you know, the US news media was, they were right on it, right? So I decided, I better go ask. I better go ask. So I go down to, to uh, Florida with my BBC television crew and sit down to a very polite British interview with Clayton Roberts, who's the Florida chief of elections, kind of, um, uh, when you see Catherine Harris, you'll see like this bullet-headed little guy who's like a Doberman next to her leg all the time. That's Clayton. Clayton. And, and so I talked to Clayton. And I be, asked him about the election, agreed to the interview. Then um, I pulled out this document, which you could see because it's big lettering, confidential trade secret. And his eyes started shaking back and forth, and he's reading it upside down. He, he knows exactly what page I have, and I'm beginning to pull it out, and he whips off his microphone, does a 50-yard dash across the uh, camera wires, runs into his office, locks the door, and calls in the state troopers to remove me and my camera crew from the state building. Um, I guess he had another appointment. <laughs> Or maybe it was something in the document. 
And what was in the document was for $2 million, it says that the company would do something called manual verification using telephone calls. Now, I talked to a lot of database experts, probably given, given the town room, there's probably some here who will tell you that I'm really serious. Items like when Victoria's Secret is trying to sell um, crotchless panties, they'll, they'll check their lists with phone calls, especially if it's important. The idea is that one of the reasons that this contract was supposed to be expensive is you have hundreds of people uh, making phone calls to verify information about people to make sure they got the right Thomas Cooper, which there are 77 in the Florida phone book alone. Okay? Now, um, so I called Database Technologies because they had to provide the documentation because they were acting for a public agency. So I said, could you please provide the experts, the database experts, some out of here in Seattle, by the way. I got a lot of volunteers, and I want to talk to you about that later, too. Um, they said, ask for the call sheets. I called, and I said, can I have the call sheets? I said, yeah, we usually have call sheets. That's right. And I said, could you give me the call sheets for this contract? They said, we don't have any. And I said, what do you mean you don't have any? He says, manual tele verification using telephone calls. He says, well, in this case, uh, the telephone calls didn't involve dialing a telephone. <laughs> All right. Now, okay, you're like Seattle, right? So like it's West Coast, so it's like, this was like really new age, you know? Didn't involve dialing a telephone. So I'm doing this, so I'm saying, I'm gonna clear my head and try to understand clearing. No dialing the telephone. And I couldn't get it. I just, I, I, I couldn't get it. That's, so that's why I went down to Clay and asked him, and when I have a photocopy to check for the phone calls that weren't, that didn't, weren't done. The phone is no phone, right? And so um, you saw that, you heard about that on, on CBS television, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, CBS television did call me, Dan Rather's operation. I want to talk about Dan because uh, CBS television called me and said, what a great story. Give us a piece of it, would you? Come on. And I said, well, you know, you're a competitor on BBC, but okay, I'll give you something. I'm an American. I want this story to come out. So they said, give us something new and special. We're down in Florida. Run it tonight. This is, you know, everything is tonight. Special investigation. 12 seconds. And um, the, um, so I said, you know what? It's not just Catherine Harris and her office and her predecessor involved in this, it was Jeb Bush's office got involved. Jeb Bush's office, my information says, sent out a letter which ordered elections supervisors in the county to remove legal voters. September 18, 2000, I've heard about this letter, I've got, I've been, read this letter, I have every word of it, but I don't have the physical letter. Check this out. This is what Bush did. And so now, oh, so you know what Bush did is that I said, now it's a, it's a little complicated. Whoa, and then I realized, uh oh, I just said complicated to American network producer. I said, don't worry, we can get it so Dan can read it. <laughs> you know, I don't want to confuse you. So I said, it's a little complicated. What it is is, remember the 90.2% of the people on the list were innocent? Well, there are a lot of felons in Florida who can vote. You don't necessarily lose your vote if you get clemency, okay? If uh, you get clemency or um, you come from another state. Because if you come from the state of, of Washington, in fact, um, about 19, here's an interesting fact, about 1964, the state of Washington, which was the only state in the North to take away people's civil rights if they were convicted of a felony, during the middle of the civil rights era, got rid of that law. So, it, in state, so if you come from the state of Washington and you're convicted of a felony after 1964, you have the right to vote restored. And you don't lose it just because you moved to Florida. In fact, the courts have twice told Jeb Bush and Katherine Harris, stop taking away people's civil rights just because they move to the state of Florida. You're still part of the United States whether you like it or not. Okay? Right? It was part of a, um, and this, these court orders came down before the election, before the election. 
because there was a law in, in effect at that time called the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> you don't, that's what the law was and will be if we have something to do with it. Um, anyway, so I gave this story to CBS, but despite the court orders and everything, Bush's office, governor's office, sent out a letter saying, remove these people. And I looked through this list, and I counted 2,873 people on this list who fell into that category. People, there were like 40 people from Washington State here who had moved to Florida, and they had the right to vote. Um, and they were on that list. And they were removed. And um, do the arithmetic. Oh, by the way, here's something you, you may not know. If you want to know how that affected the election, 2,873 votes, 537 determined the election. The Democratic Party may not want to tell you this, but you go to jail whether you're black, you're white, you're rich, you're poor, you come out and you're a Democrat. <laughs> go to jail and you come out a Democrat. I don't know. You know, you may not reform, you may you know, go back and commit other crimes, but you become a Democrat. People, that's what the demographics are, and they know it, every, they know it, the Republicans. You knock out ex-felons, and you've knocked out 93% are Democrats. And, and they're not guessing because they know the rich, you know. So, um, and about 40,000, 50,000 people minimum, according to experts at the University of Minnesota, I had them check it out for Nation Magazine, uh, they said at least 50,000 people were prevented from registering that had the legal right to register, almost all Democrats. Yeah, I know one election supervisor, by the way, told me uh, she refused to violate the law. She said, I'm not going to jail for Jeb, but another one threw out the list because well, Linda Howell, I liked her from Washington County, uh, and she's a Republican, and she stood up against the list and threw it out because Linda Howell was on the list. <laughs> now, she, now, I'm an investigative reporter, so I wasn't going to, I said, Linda, confess. <laughs> you know, I go, she said, I'm not a felon. I said, well, prove it. Because under Jeb's law, you'd have to then, you, you, he did say there was a, an out. You could go and ask Jeb then for clemency, which he did grant. 30,000 people asked. He hardly handed out a single one, except he did allow Chuck Colson Um, I wonder who voted. Anyway, CBS, remember the CBS report? So you saw that on CBS. What happened was uh, they didn't run it that night. And they didn't run it the next night or the next night. And then they called, I called them and said, what happened to the story I gave about Jeb Bush in the letter of September 18th and ordering, whether you had the letter or not, you could go and check out that the supervisors were ordered to remove these legal voters. And they said, CBS Dan ran his operation, oh, we, um, we investigated and your story didn't stand up. Now I get this all the time from US news producers, the US reporters and newspapers. Your story, Greg, your story didn't stand up. Okay, you know, but that could be true too. So I said, why, how, what, in, what was your investigation? The story didn't stand up. And they said, well, we called Jeb Bush's office. And they, <laughs> they said, you know, he didn't do it. Okay, I decided. Despite that exhaustive investigation by CBS, <laughs> I decided to check it out myself. And um, in fact, I called, it was interesting, Indy Media here, the Indy Media affiliate in London filmed me calling the, the Florida Secretary of State's office, actually, no, excuse me, Jeb Bush's office. And I said, um, can I have, I knew the date, I said, can I have a letter from your files dated September 18th, 2000, um, in which the governor orders the removal of felon voters from other states. Could you please send me that information? Oh, we don't have such a letter. Now it's the end of February, and the Civil Rights Commission has already gotten my information on this. And they started asking Jeb to produce his records because the general counsel said, this is evidence of deliberate attempt to violate civil rights of American citizens in the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, which is called biased, meaning that they have black people on it. Um, the lawyer was black. Um, and they wanted this evidence. So Bush sent them evidence, and, he sent, and they said, well, we don't have, this is beginning of March, we don't have such a document. 
Does that letter doesn't exist. So it doesn't exist. You sure, it's September 18th. I even signed by a Janet Keels. I have information. I can even read you the words. It doesn't exist. We do have a letter dated February 23rd, 2001. I said, and they sent that to me, faxed that to me. This letter here. And this is kind of interesting because it says, Janet Keels, seal, says, and it says, if people come from out of state who have a criminal record, but their rights come from states like Washington, please help them register to vote. Very nice, clean, honest. Okay, that's, that says that's our policy. It says, some confusion has recently arisen regarding the effect, of, you know, it's, it's like some confusion has arisen. Uh-huh. Maybe an investigation has arisen. But I don't know, you know, I, I don't want to be a conspiracy nut. So, um, but I said, could you check the governor's um, files, not there. And what about the computers? I mean, this stuff wasn't written in Quill, I assume. I mean, it was, um, you know. Um, it must, why don't you check the, the computers? And not there. Not there. Now, pick up this month's Harper's because it has Catherine letters, uh, Catherine Harris's screed, it goes on and on. Don't blame, you're twisted and maniacal, don't blame me. Um, she said, don't blame me, it's the legislature, it's the attorney general, everyone told me to do all these things, including, and I got a letter from Jeb Bush before the election. <laughs> I called up the Secretary of State's office a couple of weeks ago. And I said, uh, I have a letter from uh, your Secretary of State. I didn't say it started out, you know, it started out calling me twisted and knife. I just said I got a letter. And, and it references a letter from Governor Bush to, uh, regarding felons out of state, da 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 da. Could you please fax that to me? September 18, 2000. Thank you. February 23rd. So, before the election, remove them. Democrats, you find them, hunt them down, get them around. And after the election, Democrats may vote. Well, but now it will be uh, investigated by um, Mr. Ashcroft. I'm sure we'll do a heck of a job <laughs> getting behind that one. And the Washington Post. Oh, they're, they're on the case. Oh, I shouldn't knock them because they did run my story. This is how I, I end up in trouble. Um, but um, the uh, Ted Koppel, uh, great guy. And um, he, he was, we have a deal with Ted Koppel. I mean, the BBC and ABC have this film trading agreement. I'm BBC News Night, he's ABC Nightline. We can trade film for free. Now, free in American enterprise is a really good price. So they could get my stories for free, but they decided not to, even though people suggest that they run some of my stories, like Clayton Roberts running away and all that, you get it for free. They didn't want it. They said, we're going to do our own investigation. Because one thing I did discover quite rapidly was that despite the fact that James Baker told you that there were, uh, that the votes were counted six times in Florida, um, and he's, you know, we trust him, but um, um, in fact, they were all counted six times except for 180,000 ballots. 180,000 ballots were never counted because they were spoiled. Now, that raised the question, how do you spoil a ballot? Do you leave it out of the fridge too long? You know, like, <laughs> what does it mean, a spoiled ballot? Spoiled ballot, so, so there's a, it's, for some reason, it, it can't be counted. It can't be counted. So Florida law says you have to um, uh, try to determine the voters' intent. And so spoiled ballots include those, and I saw these, which were, in which the name Al Gore was checked and Al Gore was written in. Can you guess the intent of the voter? <laughs> spoiled. Al Gore's name circled, not checked, etc. But the most interesting thing about the spoiled ballots is that not all, everybody's ballot was spoiled so easily for reasons that are very interesting. The, whether your ballot spoiled or not had to do with the color of the voter. Hmm, because 100 of the 67 counties in Florida, the number of spoiled ballots was almost, in, in county to county was in direct proportion to the number of black people in the county. 
interesting. Ted Koppel and his team are on the case. They go down. Why is it that all these black ballots were spoiled? And he gets professors and experts, and they say, well, you know, Jesse Jackson registered all these thousands of new voters, and, and they're really, you know, they don't have, uh, they're not necessarily very educated, and they're not used to the ballots, and it's very difficult, and the ballots are very sophisticated and hard to understand. And, and uh, in other words, blacks is too dumb to vote. Now, if that's true, okay, we'll have to live with that racist conclusion. It's a racist remark, but it may be true. Okay? I'll have to, I'll, but I thought, I'll take a look myself. And, and I go down to Leon County, Tallahassee, the, the capital. But Leon County is where it's situated. Go into the office of the election supervisor, terrific guy, Ian Sancho. And he's got a voting box set up. And they look a lot like this, a voting booth, a voting machine. Most counties, you've heard all about the chads and the butterflies. That's, that was not, most of the counties don't use chads and butterflies and all that stuff. They use paper ballots, which is still the best way to vote because it, it leaves, a, you can leave a paper trail. Catherine Harris wants to change the voting systems, by the way, to touch screen voting. I just want to know who else is touching the screen. <laughs> Catherine. Um, okay, so I check it. So I, I take a ballot. I go up to it has a, a you can practice voting or whatever, and I, I mark off. And this is really true. I marked off uh, you know who I voted for, um, Pat Buchanan and Ralph Nader, and I see, and then there's a little slot at the top, and you stick the the ballot, the paper ballot in, and then it went back in my hand. Okay. So I try to stick it back in, I kind of shove it back in, and it came back in my hand. Like, you know, like when you put in a kind of crap dollar or into a, 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 you know, one of those change machines or something. So I call over a clerk, I say, whoa, what is this? He says, well, you marked off two presidential candidates. You can't do that. You can't, because then the machine won't be able to read it. It knows you made a mistake and it gives it back to you. We give you a new ballot and we vote again. You can get three ballots in Florida to try again. Easy to make, very easy to make a wrong mark or vote wrong on these things. We show you what mistake you made. I said, well, well, wait, wait, but how can you, how do the ballots spoil then? I mean, you can't make a mistake. She said, yeah, it's really hard. It says, in our county, only one in 200 votes was spoiled. I said, but what about Gadsden? Now, Gadsden is right next door to Leon County, but there's a difference between Leon, which is white, and Gadsden, which is 57% which is black, the blackest county of 67 in Florida, which also had the highest number of spoiled ballots. One in eight votes in Gadsden was not counted. One in eight people in the blackest county of Florida, their votes didn't count, literally. Because how can that happen? They have a different setup. They use chads or butterflies. No, no, no. They have the same paper ballot and these machines, optical readers, too. I said, but I don't get it. How could, you can't, how could one in eight ballots be spoiled? She said, well, see, we, you know, this reject mechanism, it's, you've got to set the buttons, you know. It's how you set the program the machine. Oh, so it ain't that black voters was too dumb to vote, but that white reporters was too dumb to ask. And the Washington Post is on that because the day before yesterday, they finally ran a story saying, you know, there's difference in voting, you know, that, and they, in, in Leon County, you can, you know, um, get, you know, these white counties, you can get your ballot back, and in black counties, you couldn't. Not that there's any racial implication in that. It's Washington Post. We need voting reform. Yeah. Maybe we need newspaper media coverage reform. story of the election, I, I, you know, I'm a business reporter. I follow the money. I mean, that's my, that's my thing. And, and so I started out, I was covering the election. I was covering, I was covering um, 
the who gave the money for this? Like I was fascinated with the fact that there was a quarter million dollars given for a um, quarter billion dollars raised by the Democratic Party in that election cycle with uh, not just Democrats, but the parallel spending and the rest. And the Republicans get W elected and the Republicans spent about 400 million, including parallel spending from uh, like Mr. Gates, and um, which is off the record, but about 400 million altogether. So it's nearly half a billion. I'm thinking kind of interesting. Instead of elect, you know, it would have been more efficient instead of election to have a, an auction, right? Um, but I said, who, who's giving this money? Who's giving this money? And I'm going through the usual list of suspects to start. The number one giver for the Republican Party is Enron. Number, uh, number two is uh, Exxon. Number three is a company called Southern Company. We'll talk about them. Um, but then near the top, near, in the, under the bees, is a company called Barrick Gold Mining. Now, I never heard of Barrick Gold Mining, so it kind of it literally piqued my interest. I said, well, who the heck is Barrick and why? And it was interesting, Barrick Gold Mining of Canada. Now, why would the Canadians be so patriotic as to support our democratic process and give money to the Republicans and a couple of Democrats as well, you know? You know, they may, you may buy, be able to buy the Republican Party, but uh, you can only rent the Democrats, right? And, um, but who, who, who are these characters? Uh, and they did through the U.S. subsidiary. It's nice and legal. And I'm looking at the Barrett Gold and their websites and all that. And who's on their international board of directors, board of advisors, as they call them, but George Herbert Walker Bush. He went, he went to work for them, apparently, after he left the White House. I said he left, and two-thirds of the American people asked him to leave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Have faith. Um, okay. Now, I looked around. Now, there's no guy named Joe Barrick or Sid Barrick. Who is Barrick Goldmine? So I'm looking, and it's that well-known Canadian, the guy that's founded the company, with the, whose money founded the company, is that well-known Canadian, Adnan Khashoggi. Oh, that rang a bell. Um, if you remember, Khashoggi was the arms dealer, the bag man, the billionaire Saudi Arabian arms dealer who um, gave guns the Ayatollah Khomeini in return for funding, their funding the hostages, the, uh, giving, buying off the hostages in Lebanon in return for funding illegally the, the Contras, right? Um, and uh, uh, so that was the Iran Contra scandal. Um, and he was the bag man in that story, which is interesting. In other words, George, uh, our Bush senior went to work for the, for the man who armed the axis of evil. <laughs> but, you know, the guy's got to work, right? And so, um, so I'm wondering about this. But then I, I said, but why what would they want, you know, what do you want to use president for? Anyway, I mean, why hire him? He's out of office. And he, I mean, did he, was there something that was done that they were grateful for? Sure enough, I look, Bureau of Land Management. Bureau of Land Management. Um, there's a mineral. The the uh, there's a Mineral Claims Act, Mineral Mining Act of 1873, which allowed miners during the gold rush to make claims on a property. You know, you remember his Treasure Sierra Madre. There was the guy with the the funny hat and donkey, and he has the pan of gold, and he says, you know, pans gold finds gold nugget. Says Eureka, I found it. Runs off the claims office, stakes a claim, puts down five dollars, and gets an acre of land that he can mine. Okay. Um, Bush sent Bush's administration just before he left established an expedited procedure to perfect claims. That's the legal term. Perfect the claim on gold mines. And one gold mining company that took advantage of this and the Apparently the only one, maybe the only one, but um, there was a $10 billion ore body, $10 billion worth of gold in Nevada. Maybe the biggest, certainly the biggest gold mine in America, maybe the world. The claim was perfected under a special expedited procedure for a payment to the U.S. Treasury of a little less than $10,000. Eureka! Someone found it, huh? And uh, that was Barrett Gold Mining of Canada. Now, um, oh yeah, 
What was the last thing that Daddy Bush did what, before he left office? Pardoned Adnan Khashoggi of his crimes. Pardoned him, went to work. Okay, so I, re I thought this was interesting. I reported it, and my paper got sued. Guardian newspapers, like kind of the Washington Post of Britain, and it's Sunday paper as well, which is the Observer, for which I read a column. We are sued. No First Amendment in Britain is why we have the Fourth of July. There's no written constitution. There's no freedom of the press. This is serious stuff. And one of the reasons I can report what I do is that the paper is owned by a not-for-profit charitable trust. It's not on the money making. But it can't, it can't defend against, you know, an enraged billionaire. By this time, Khashoggi had taken the money and ran Bush uh, had resigned to work on his son's campaign, and um, but the company was there and sued because what they said was not that these individual facts are wrong to pardon the mind of money. They said a reasonable, under British law, I just have to prove that, that someone could read this in a defamatory manner. They, what they said was that a reasonable person reading these separate facts might believe that there's a connection. <laughs> All right. So, so I don't, I don't want to sink my paper. So I said, okay, no problem. I, you know, I, besides, my job as a reporter is to lay out the dots and you draw the, the lines. Anyway, I, so save my paper. Said, go ahead. Uh, no connection. So that's our theme tonight, you know. So I don't want anyone here getting me in trouble making connections. So uh, let's review that. Khashoggi got the gold mine, the public got the shaft, Daddy got the job, Sonny got the money, and there are no connections. <laughs> I'm, careful, careful. You too might be a conspiracy nut and think that, you know, like that they sold guns to the Ayatollah in return for funding the Contras. Yeah. Oh, but what did Bush do after for Barrett Gold Mining of Canada? I looked on their website and said the International Advisory Board, which is, which is uh, Bush and Brian uh, Mulroney, the used Prime Minister of Canada, and a couple of other characters, um, helped Barrick obtain a gold mining concession in Tanzania. Okay, I don't know. What do I know? So I look it up. Sometimes I wish I don't look these things up because what I found out is that they began trying to get this concession in about 1994-95. Uh, it was owned by another Canadian company, Sutton Resources, um, this gold property in, um, in Tanzania. It was worthless because there were already miners on it. You know, guys in the funny hats and donkeys, small scale miners, 30,000 miners who already had permits for the land. They were Tanzanians. So the Canadians couldn't come in or the American-Canadian-Saudi operation couldn't move because the Tanzanians were still there and the courts there ruled that in fact these the 30,000 miners there had the right to be there because they had permits they had their little claim things and so in August 1996 and one midnight they rolled Sutton resources rolled bulldozers across the property and smashed down all the workers homes followed by military police firing weapons. They smashed down their homes, they destroyed their equipment, they filled in all the mining pits. All the miners were chased off the property permanently, ex well, except for 50 miners who were still in their mining pits when they were covered over. That's our information. Okay. Amnesty International and others have put that up. And I reported that we got sued. Very cool. They wanted me to sign a statement that I would, they were going to sue us into oblivion unless I signed a statement saying that I happily confirm, and my newspaper can, this quote, happily confirm, that no one died in the peaceful clearance of the mine. And I'd say, well, nothing would, I, I would be very happy to confirm that if you give me some evidence. They said the evidence is that we're billionaires, we've got a mean law firm, and you're going to sign it. I said, well, I like a little better, more evidence than that. Let's get an independent human rights expert. Let's get someone, uh, there's a, a, a guy, and I want you to remember his name, Tundu Lissu, L-I-S-S-U. Okay, he's, he's a um, 
a, a human rights attorney, internationally renowned, works at the World Resources Institute in Washington, decided to send him to Tanzania, flew him there to get the evidence and confirm people did die, didn't die, or whatever. Reliable. He sent back to me, email with an attached photo. And I also have this, unfortunately, in color, uh, which is, uh, if you look at it, it's a corpse with its head crushed in and arms set, hands severed off from a, apparently from a bulldozer. He brought back signed, he sent signed and sworn uh, witness statements and including a videotape of the bodies being exhumed from the police files. Okay. So I sent that to Barrick and Barrick got that and um, my paper got that and I said, okay, now what do you want to do? I'm happy, you know, give me an explanation. In you know, other words, if you have, and they, then they started the explanations, oh, it's wrong, this is extortion or that's not really from that, you know, they had, they had reasons. I said, fine, I'll run, now that you have this material, I won't run, um, I'll run your side of the story. No. <laughs> you will happily confirm. I said, well, I can't. I said, and I was about to, because my paper was saying, and a lot of investigative reporters have written saying, you know, it's not America. There is no First Amendment. And this is just how it is. So just, it cost a fortune to defend this thing. So, you know, just sign off. But there was a little problem in that tundra. Listen, the investigator was charged with sedition in Tanzania for sending out the evidence. For obtaining evidence out of police files. His law partners were beat up. Opposition members were arrested, disappeared. Tanzania. So if I sign that document, they would use that against him. So I said, I can't sign. Okay. And human rights groups, by the way, I don't want to thank Friends of the Year. I don't want to thank Amnesty International, which withdrew the accusation after they got the evidence. Um, then, and then Friends of the Earth, um, a group called Carter House, Bianca Jagger, by the way, came in and jumped on and seen others, and um, went to the courts and said, you can't allow a lie to stand and say and cover up what is apparent genocide. And the courts said, no, we can't, we won't allow them. Believe it or not, they said it was extraordinary in British jurisprudence history. We won't allow a, the, this company, or even if the paper agrees, we're not going to allow the judge that you can't say that people didn't die. Okay? And um, now, Tundu got out, we got him out of um, Washington, but he said he's going back. He went back. Because even though I said not to, his wife said not to, I said, they're going to arrest you. And he said, I'll be lucky if I get arrested, but I have to finish this, bring out the truth. And so we have been, I gave you his name because we're running an international campaign to make sure that he is released or not charged, that, that the charges are dropped and that we try to save his life. And that campaign has been headed by Congressman Cynthia McKinney. Oh, there's more on that. Actually, you know, it's very interesting. I had a, um, I, I almost got some of that. You, you saw that on, on television, CNN? No? Almost, almost, because I was going to be on CNN television. Jim Wolfenson, the president of the World Bank, uh, got on CNN. Um, there's going to be a G7 meeting before the, life of the last G7 meeting, but he's got on, on, on CNN to say how wonderful globalization was. You know, just the wonders of globalization, the wonders of his organization, the, um, that the World Bank, which is a development bank, they help all the little tiny brown people develop. And globalization is wonderful. You all get cell phones for the uh, Bolivians, right? Okay, fine. Um, CNN asked me to come on and either respond, question what Wolfson was saying, whatever. And, um, and I wanted to because one of the things I wanted to ask about is that they are a development bank and the biggest single development loan guarantee in the World Bank's history so that, um, was granted for gold mining in Tanzania to Barrick Gold Mining. 
So I had a couple questions for Mr. Wolfenson. But not only that, but I had questions for him about something else too because, um, where is it here? I had a, um, some documents, it's unusual, some documents somehow grew legs, crawled out of his file cabinet, and landed on my desk. <laughs> Sat down, and there they were. Hundreds, thousand, about 3,000 pages of internal docu documents from the World Bank, the, and then I also got some from the IMF and the WTO, um, which just happened to arrive on my desk. And, um, and this one says, it's very funny, it says, I don't know if it's funny, it says, that, this document has restricted distribution and may be used only by recipients in the performance of their official duties. So I, I received my official, I'm an investigative reporter, my official duty is to show it to you, right? <laughs> yeah. And you'll get some of this, a lot of this in the book, including copies of this stuff. I'm going to try to get more on my website, www.gregpowles.com, uh, which you've got to go to. And, um, this, this is about Argentina, actually. It's called Country Assistance Plan. Country Assistance Plan said, why is that secret? You think that, man, they're assisting a country that they want to like jump up and shout, we're assisting Argentina, they're in real trouble, aren't they? And, and in fact, it even has a, one of the pages, this is just a page, but I have, um, it's like about 70 pages, the, the document, and uh, there's a section called Helping the Poor and Unemployed, I say, right on. And, it, and under Helping the Poor and Unemployed, it's, it's requiring, secretly requiring Argentina to drop its unemployment payments by 20%. Okay, it's a little tiny rule that if, if something is secret, you want to see it because, see, they don't, they don't hide good things, you know, they don't say, oh, we're really doing something wonderful for, for Argentina, but shh, keep it a secret for Christmas or something. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask Jim about the assistance to Argentina, and I wanted to ask him maybe about the, the Barrick Mine or bring these things up. And Almost, Wolfenson and the World Bank told CNN, if Greg Pallast is put on the air, Greg Pallast is on the air, not only won't Wolfenson appear, he will not elect, he will not let CNN use the footage of an interview, of an interview they've already taped. And CNN did the courageous thing and yanked me off the air. Okay, that's and your news isn't censored.